This is Blood and Cancer, the official podcast of MDH Hematology Oncology. And welcome to the final episode of Blood and Cancer for the year 2020. We hope you will join us on this best of episode with some of our best content from one of the craziest years that many of us can remember. Remember, there there are links to each of these original episodes in the show notes. Blood and Cancer will be back in 2021 with the latest in blood and hematology and oncology news, as well as clinical interviews with our editor-in-chief, Dr. David Henry. Okay, let's jump right into it. Welcome to this podcast. I'm your host, Dr. David Henry. This first clip we're highlighting in the best of blood and cancer is from our episode on ESMO, European Society of Medical Oncology 2020. In this clip, you'll hear a review of results from a phase three trial comparing secotuzumab, govotecan, to physician's choice of therapy in patients with previously treated metastatic triple negative breast cancer, a really difficult population. And follow on to that same discussion, joining me was Dr. Alan Liss, who reviews a phase three trial comparing tezolizumab plus nabpaclitaxel to nabpaclitaxel only in previously untreated locally advanced or metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So I think you might enjoy this session very much. So um, let me then go to breast cancer, an abstract I saw, um, talking about triple negative. And this was LBA-17, the ASCENT trial, and the title is a randomized phase three study of secotuzumab govotecan. Uh, in the States, just for reference, it's uh, Trudelvi. The, the generic names, the trade names get me very confused sometimes. So secotuzumab govotecan, of course, is the, the, the molecule name, versus physician's treatment of choice in patients with previously treated metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And this uh, presenting uh, author was out of Boston, so here in the States. And uh, the point being that if you've had one, two therapies, triple negative breast cancer, the next three, four lines don't do very well. So this presentation took those patients, and this is a first in class in any, uh, antibody drug conjugate, an antitrope 2 antibody coupled with the active metabolite of aronotecan, SN38. Now, I remember, I think you and I were at ASCO a couple of years ago when we first saw this, and it was terrific results. You're so, absolutely right. We were sitting together. Yeah, remember that? And so mm -hmm. here it is again. And uh, what happened? So after two lines or more, and you had to have had a taxane, you were randomized to get this molecule, the antibody drug conjugate, or physician's choice. And those tended to be capecitabine, aribulin, venerelbine, um, or a gemcitabine. Primary endpoint progression free survival, but they find 529 patients, so, so not small, not terrifically large. Um, there was a significant improvement in progression free survival, 5.6 versus 1.7 months, very statistically significant. Median overall survival, 12.1 versus 7.1 uh, versus 6.7 months, again significant, and a response rate of 35% versus 5% in those other third liners that went up against capecitabine, aribulin, venerelbine, or, or gemcitabine. The um, safety was not so bad. Um, of course, there's neutropenia, a little more in the, the antibody drug conjugate, a little more diarrhea, some anemia, some febrile neutropenia, not huge. And so in this phase three trial, uh, they concluded significant progression-free and overall survival improvement in this antibody drug conjugate, in versus physician's choice of some third, fourth, fifth lines in pretreated metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So I, I like this a lot. This is approved actually in the States for this exact population, previous two lines of therapy. So I, I thought that was again, um, a nice randomized trial, a good data set and good outcome. I, I agree with you completely. And the interesting thing to me was the objective response rate, PFS and overall survival were almost exactly what was predicted in the smaller phase one and phase two trials of this drug when you and I were sitting together at ASCO several years ago in a really heavily pretreated patient population. 
think some of these patients had had up to 17 prior lines of therapy. I don't know where they came up with all these lines of therapy. Right. That's right. So really, uh, really very, very impressive. So um, a good one. That's a keeper. So back to you. I think you wanted to continue the breast cancer theme. I do. Uh, the next one that I wanted to highlight was LBA-16. This was the overall survival analysis of Impassion 130. This was a phase three study of NAB paclitaxel plus either atezolizumab or placebo in previously untreated advanced or metastatic triple negative breast cancer. So again, triple negative breast cancer. And what they did was they randomized over 900 patients with triple negative breast cancer, locally advanced or metastatic disease to first line NAB paclitaxel with either the immune checkpoint inhibitor or tezolizumab or an identical placebo. These patients were unselected for but stratified by PDL1 tumor proportion status. And as, as our listeners may remember, based on impressive improvement in progressive free survival in the PDL1 positive patients, the combination of atezolizumab plus nabpaclitaxel was approved for use in PDL1 positive triple negative breast cancer after the publication of a New, Gene, New England Journal article in 2018. A co primary endpoint at that time was overall survival, but the trial was too immature for analysis of overall survival at the time of original publication. And what they found in this trial, looking at overall survival, is that in a median follow-up of one and a half years, median overall survival with the atezolizumab plus nabpaclitaxel combination was 21 months in comparison with 18 months placebo plus nab in the overall population. But in the pdl one positive patients, who were about 60% of the patients overall, the differences were more dramatic. Two years with atezolizumab compared with one and a half years for placebo, a 7.5 months difference in overall survival, which probably really is significant to oncologists and to patients. In the pdl one positive group, this translated to a likelihood of being alive at three years of 36% compared to 22% for placebo plus NAB paclitaxel. And I think anybody would choose the combination with the tezolizumab with a difference like that. There were no new safety signals beyond what was known from the prior um, publication, about 80% adverse events leading to treatment discontinuation for tezolizumab versus 1% for placebo. And why I think we should care about this is that if overall survival is the coin of the realm, and it is, Atezolizumab plus NAB paclitaxel in patients with advanced triple negative breast cancer offers quantitatively significant benefit in patients with PDL1 positive um, disease of at least 1%. Another reason we should care is that this is coming on the heels of Keynote 355, which you and I heard presented at Virtual ASCO 2020, in which the pembrolizumab was combined with several different chemotherapy regimens. And it really does appear solid now that immune checkpoint inhibitors can be helpful in these patients. And I think it advances the goal of tailoring the right treatment for the right patient. A third reason why I think this is important is because of what you said, Dave. There are not infinite numbers of good options for second, third, and fourth line treatment of these patients. There are additional toxicities involved with moving on to subsequent therapy. So if we can extend remission duration and now survival, for these patients, it's worthwhile. The one caveat that I would throw in here is that we've got to be concerned a little bit about what the chemotherapy partner with the immune checkpoint inhibitor is. Yes, yeah. At this ESMO meeting, as you know, the preliminary results of Impassion 131, in which standard paclitaxel, not NAB paclitaxel, was pa partnered with atezolizumab, that was completely negative. And in Keynote 355, Although taxanes of any type seemed to work well with Pembro, the results were somewhat better in patients who had not received taclitaxel in the adjuvant setting. So I think we have to stay tuned um, about this, but for now, nabpaclitaxel looks like a perfectly safe partner with an immune checkpoint inhibitor if one wants to use a taxane in the PDL1 positive advanced triple negative breast cancer patients. The following clip is from our episode on COVID-19 and how it can affect various systems of the body. One of our guests, Dr. Kartik Segal, explains the role of ACE2, ACE2,
the interoceptor for SARS-CoV-2, a fascinating discussion of how this is a ubiquitous in nature and humans, and the virus loves and attaches to this ACE2 site. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I learned from your article and review that uh, it's expressed on a lot of tissues, but of course, for the virus to find and bind, it's got to get in. So one of the easiest ways to get in is through respiratory. And you mentioned that it's highly expressed in nasopharynx and uh, in the re respiratory upper bronchial epithelium. And interestingly, tell me if I understood this correctly, once it starts to bind to that marker, it tends to enhance the expression of that marker. So it's kind of self-fulfilling that it gets a really going because more and more ACE2 is expressed in the, in this case, the lining of the lung, and the virus has a better time getting in. Do I have that right? What we know so far is that uh, is from a small study in which uh, the researchers compared and looked at the ACE2 expression uh, once uh, this SARS-CoV-2 virus bound to uh, the lung epithelial cells compared to what influenza could do. And uh, there was a, a finding that ACE2 expression was enhanced by binding to the SARS-CoV-2 virus, unlike uh, the influenza virus. Again, it was a small study of a very few patients or a few uh, patient samples. Uh, so it still needs to be explored further. Uh, and uh, because there is also some evidence that the ACE2 receptor can be downregulated uh, when uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus binds to it. So there is some um, kind of findings which support that it does kind of utilize that pathway in terms of the self-fulfilling prophecy of increasing uh, the infection, but it still still needs to be teased out a little bit more. Go beyond the headlines and hear the full story on Cleveland Clinic's Cancer Advances podcast. It's the medical professional's trusted source for exploring the latest innovative research and clinical breakthroughs happening in the field of oncology. From the highest profile cancer trials conducted at our research facilities to understanding how they impact your patients. Cleveland Clinic's world-renowned experts take a deeper look. Listen to the latest Cancer Advances episode by visiting clevelandclinic.org slash cancer advances podcast. This next clip is from episode of the EHA, the European Hematology Association, and speaking with the president, Dr. John Gribben, and he reviews a phase three trial comparing venetoclax plus azacitidine to azacitidine alone, a placebo, in treatment of treatment naive patients with AML. He will also discuss a very nice discussion of phase two trial comparing ropo -peg interferon, so rope peg interferon with phlebotomy in low risk patients with polycythemia vera, where we've often just done phlebotomy, so this adds the interferon. And the phase three trial comparing esatuximab, all the myeloma doctors call it ESA, plus carfilzomib and dexamethasone to carfilzomib and dexamethasone only in relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. Well, let me begin then on some of the content we wanted to discuss that came out of the meetings. And I thought what I might do is read you the title of the abstract and have you comment what you thought and how it might be important or practice changing. The first one was entitled, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study of venetoclax with azacitidine versus adacitidine alone in treatment-naive patients with acute myeloid leukemia ineligible for intensive therapy. Yeah, Courtney DiNardo, I thought, did a really, really good job of presenting this late-breaking abstract. Uh, we've known, of course, in, in the U.S., venetoclax is, of course, already licensed for the treatment of, uh, of AML. Uh, in Europe, it's still waiting license, although interestingly, because of the COVID crisis, we are unexpectedly getting early access into this combination right, yeah. because, of course, it's a very attractive proposition to be offering to patients in the setting of, uh, of COVID where you want to avoid uh, this, uh, this setting. So we already knew that venetoclax looked as if it had very good efficacy in uh, acute myeloid leukemia. And of course, the um, Evali uh, study series of studies looking at this particular one looked at venetoclax plus um, azacitidine versus adacitidine plus placebo and clearly met its primary endpoint in demonstrating very impressive uh, improvement in progression-free survival. It clearly demonstrates 
And remembering, of course, this is a group of patients in whom we've seen very little progress in their outcome for acute myeloid leukemia for decades. So advances that we see in this way really, really moving the field. All we need now is the, uh, the oral azacitidine. And of course, we saw the phase one uh, and phase two trials coming out from that. So if we can get that combination and move to an oral oral combination for acute myeloid leukemia. I think this, the data was unequivocal in the elderly patient population that, uh, that Courtney presented. Um, and of course, the big question everyone has is, is it going to find a place you know, in younger patients and how are we going to couple it with other things? Because pretty much at the moment, whatever you add to um, azacitidine is, uh, whatever you add to, sorry, venetoclax, it is really showing an improvement. But the azacitidine venetoclax combination looks particularly attractive. Was this study de novo AML or perhaps seniors who had this was, MDS? This, going to... this was this was de novo AML, but um, there was, of course, a presentation at the meeting also on the MDS. Uh, wasn't uh, a, a late breaking abstract that was uh, also presented. Also demonstrate it was a much smaller study, earlier phase, not a phase three randomized trial, but looking at uh, this combination in the MDS population, also showing very, very promising results. And this would have been the azacitidine that I'm familiar with in this setting is five or seven days, and then the venetoclax, five or seven 14, days, 14 yeah. or 28 of the oral venetoclax. It was a 28-day was a 28 day cycle okay. uh, venetoclax continuous. The azacitidine, uh, I think, was seven days in this particular uh, setting that Courtney presented. Well, I think that's... Uh, continues to be practice changing for our seniors and it's morphing into the seniors who come to the table MDS to AML. So that's uh, one that I'm going to check off and watch. Uh, next one I was intrigued by, I think this might have been also a late breaker, I'll read the title. Phase two randomized clinical trial comparing row peg interferon versus phlebotomy in low risk patients with polycythemia vera results of the pre-planned interim analysis. So I, I keep, um, I think, all of the Italian data where hematocrits are 45 and higher in men and 42% and higher in women, you better keep them down. So I do yeah. that a lot. And um, this looks like this might be another option. Did that turn out well? Yeah, it was an interesting uh, presentation. And uh, of course, funny enough, I missed a little bit of it because I was online um, behind the scenes. You're a uh, little busy. I was a little busy cheering this one. So I saw I saw bits of it, and I saw uh, what I thought were the headlights, uh, the headlines of it, and I saw uh, Professor Babui uh, answering the questions. You're absolutely right; it gives um, it gives another option, but it also, of course, demonstrates that oh, you know sometimes the old flash and phlebotomy can also be quite efficient in these uh, in these circumstances, and it's everything is about weighing up risks and benefit for this particular uh, type of, of 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 population. So it's um, interesting uh thing and whether or you know whether or not uh particularly in europe and in a in a more managed market um people are going to think that the cost effectiveness and in, in terms of the benefit of using um you know the uh interferon is going to be um you know a way forward that's actually going to really change practices is something that came up in the discussion what is as clearly the case of course is that pegylating the interferon leads to a very different profile in terms of yeah, the side effect profile indeed. that you're going to see which is the really big thing i mean you and i have used interferon a lot and you know and they don't come you back can mimic, you can it. mimic you can mimic lots of the symptoms of covid-19 very quickly with uh, with the old fashioned <laughs> yes. interferon so well yeah put, i thought yeah. this was a very interesting approach well that i um... So that's a, not approved in the States either, but something as it uh, develops it will be another option because uh, the phlebotomy may not be everyone's favorite and something yeah, that you absolutely. Can do outpatient might be different. All right. Another one um, to discuss. This goes over then to myeloma. Uh, the pro, the abstract entitled is ituximab plus carfilzomib and dexamethasone versus carfilzomib and dexamethasone alone in relapsed refractory multiple myeloma interim analysis of a phase three randomized open label trial. And the escetuximab, is that uh, another CD38 antibody? So that was... It's exactly another CD, another CD38, and I'm sure we'll come back and talk about that in just a moment. So Philippe uh, Moreau presented the data for this. Um, interim analysis uh, from the Data Safety Monitoring Committee actually uh, stopped the study to say that the, the study had met its primary endpoint and that the addition of the inotuximab um, to the carfilzomib dexamethasone backbone uh, clearly demonstrated superiority in outcome in terms of progression-free survival. 
very, very clear cut data. The discussion, of course, uh, sits around where does this fit via uh, daratumumab and very, I don't think any of the patients on this study had had uh, a previous uh, CD38 antibody. So we don't know whether this is going to be something that can be useful in somebody who's already had a, a previous anti-CD38. Um, there's a lot of questions from the audience came in on that thing that you probably are most interested in. That is, how does this stack up against a daratumumab? Yes, yeah. So we have got the Candor study from before, which previously led to the approval of daratumumab in this setting. Uh, and of course, Philippe talked a lot about how the patient population wasn't really exactly the same. And it's, but it looks quite easy to say that it's, it's similar in efficacy. The big issue now, of course, is we've got daratumumab subcutaneously versus the, uh, the intravenous use still of inotuximab. So, um, but very clearly demonstrating, as we've seen in the fuselage B-cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma in the past, the addition of an antibody into triplet therapy for multiple myeloma. Uh, clearly an advance and surely moving into the front line and, and we'll see where, where we go from there. Yeah, and as you suggest, we have in the States uh, first line approval for a daratumumab combination. I think you can do it with the uh, DRD, with um, Revlimid, yep. um, lenalidomide, or even if you want to do um, a proteasome inhibitor, that's in the front line as well. So you have kind of mix and yeah, match in the front so line Yeah, setting. we have the same here in Europe, so same, same approval, so front line. And we've just uh, now got uh, uh, released the subcutaneous formulation, yes, which same here. Uh, we've only had access to before inside clinical trials, clearly leading to uh, a, a decrease in the infusion-related reactions, which, of course, have been a problem before. Those, of course, were reported the inotuximab study, but it did look as if the infusion-related reactions weren't quite as severe with intravenous inotuximab as they were in the early days of the daratumumab. So we'll see where that goes. But choices for our patient is is what these are all about and you know people now have another cd38 antibody to, to consider as part of their armamentarium yeah the uh, progress continues the next clip is from our episode on coagulation in patients with covid 19. dr adam sucker notes that vte venous thromboembolism and other thrombotic events are fairly common in covid patients he suggests that all three aspects of rare cow's triad may be at play in COVID patients with thrombotic manifestations. Continue with our theme of what's hot in the COVID era as we all try and take care of patients and adjust to the almost daily change in information. I'm delighted today to be interviewing Dr. Adam Sucker, who is a colleague of mine at the University of Pennsylvania, where he's associate professor and director of the Penn uh, uh, Center for Comprehensive Care of Hemophilia and Thrombosis and Hemostasis, and Adam Welcome to this podcast once again. Thanks for having me, David. Well, you're very welcome. And uh, as we've all learned, I'm a hematologist oncologist, and most of our listeners are in that area. But as uh, generalists, hospitalists, and certainly infectious disease doctors take care of these patients, we've learned that clotting has been a surprise issue. So I thought we cover a few things and just begin with the top of VTE, venous thromboembolism, DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. This is happening more than we would have expected in sick patients. So maybe your take on what's happening and maybe a bit about why we think that might be happening in these patients more than usual. Sure. Uh, thanks, David. So it's so interesting. The first few months where publications were being reported out of China, January, February, even into March, there was really very little written about thrombotic risk. And then we started to have a lot of patients in the United States. And I was hearing, particularly from the ICU doc, boy, we're seeing a lot of blood clots, a lot of DVT, a lot of PE, a lot of patients clotting off their uh, CVVH filter. Um, and, uh, and, and so, but it was all sort of anecdotal at that point. And then in early April, we started to have the first case series published. And those case series were reporting primarily on patients in the intensive care unit and showing truly remarkably high rates of venous thromboembolism. Uh, to summarize, probably half a dozen studies from various centers around the world, the rates of VTE were running in the 25 to 30 percent range despite the use of prophylactic intensity anticoagulation. And you know, that, that, that may even be an underestimate 
because of course, as, as our listeners know, some of these patients are so sick that they're not able to get imaging. Maybe they're not stable enough to go to the CT scanner or uh, there's a concern about exposing the, the, the tech to, to, to potentially the virus. And so some of these patients may have blood clots that have been going undiagnosed. So that's what we first noticed with very high rates of venous thromboembolism. Then uh, some additional reports started to come out, autopsy reports and unusual findings like uh, microvascular thrombosis, particularly in the lungs, almost suggestive of a, a thrombotic microangiopathy type picture. And I, I'm sure many of your listeners now have heard reports in the lay press about um, not ICU patients, not even hospitalized patients, but non-hospitalized, you know, previously healthy yeah, young young who, people, active people, yeah. Exactly, presenting with stroke. Um, I've had several patients present with this, this new disease called COVID toe syndrome, um, where um, there are sort of ischemic, uh, ischemic toes as part of the presentation, um, and that appears to have potentially a thromboembolic etiology. So lots of different thrombotic manifestations, and at least in the ICU, occurring with, with, with much greater frequency than we're used to seeing in critically ill patients. So I, I've seen a slide, well, two thoughts come to mind. One, HIT syndrome, I'll come back to that thought, and a slide you showed recently at a, an update of us here at Penn on Virchow's triad. So can you take us back to medical school and remind us what Virchow's triad is and how that may be happening here to promote more clotting than usual in these patients? Sure. Um, so the big question, of course, is what's the mechanism? Why are these patients uh, so prothrombotic? And, and you know, the short answer is that we don't know, but we're learning more every day. Uh, but whenever I think about mechanism of thrombosis, I always like to go back to Virchow's triad. And as you will recall from the, the recesses of your mind in medical school, Virchow was a German pathologist in the 1800s who postulated that thrombosis occurs because of one of three reasons. Circulatory stasis, some intrinsic hypercoagulable state in the blood, and or endothelial injury. And when I apply these to COVID patients, I think that there is at least a potential for all three to be operating. So we can start with circulatory stasis. Patients who are sick with COVID, especially those in the ICU, are immobilized. Right? Many of these patients are on uh, sedatives and paralytics and in the prone position, barely moving. And even yeah. you know, some pretty sick patients at home are, are bed bound for a few weeks with this condition. So immobilization may be playing a role. Um, then there's the hypercoagulable state. So we know that this is a, a real hyperinflammatory condition, at least in the critically ill patients. Very high levels of factor eight, of fibrinogen, um, circulating procoagulant microparticles, um, something called neutrophil extracellular traps, which may be part of the link between inflammation and thrombosis. Um, and so these patients do appear to have an intrinsic hypercoagulable state, very possibly related to the inflammatory cytokine storm that occurs in the critically ill patients. The third piece is the endothelial injury. And this is where I think it's very interesting and there may be some unique aspects to COVID. So we know that endothelials have, endothelial cells have ACE2 on their surface. And ACE2 is the portal by which the, the virus infects cells. And there's some evidence, although it is not conclusive at this point, that the virus is able to directly invade and infect endothelial cells, resulting in endothelial activation and endothelial injury. And so what this means um, is that the endothelial cells release things like factor eight and von Willebrand factor into the circulation, which are certainly prothrombotic. And the sick patients have very, very high levels of these proteins in their plasma. And then the endothelial cells may become inflamed, which, uh, which promotes basically adhesion of platelets and may underlie the thrombosis in this condition. So a lot more to learn, but I have a feeling that all three, all three. aspects of your cow's triad are at play. So the reason I mentioned HIT a moment ago is it occurred to me as I learned about heparin-induced thrombocytopenia syndrome years ago, you know, we can't just stop the heparin. Something else goes on to make these patients for the next 30 days, especially the ensuing seven days, hypercoagulable, probably because of the antibody. 
that you made against the the triad of the heparin and the platelet and the antibody. So do you think maybe we're seeing some patients who we're hearing are asymptomatic and get infected and, of course, develop some antibody? That may be operative here. Are we still learning about that? Is it somehow similar to the antibody you might generate? Yeah, I don't know if it's antibody mediated the way HIT is, um, but I do think that there are de- there are certainly parallels. So, I mean, first of all, uh, both are profoundly hypercoagulable prothrombotic states. Both seem to be associated with with both venous and arterial thrombosis. And when we when we talk about treatment, there's an interesting parallel as well. Up until a couple months ago, HIT was the only disease that I could think of where even when a patient doesn't have a clot, the risk of clotting is so high that we treat the patient with therapeutic intensity anticoagulation. So if you know a patient has what's called isolated HIT, if they're diagnosed with HIT but they have no clinically apparent thrombosis, as you say, we not only treat them by stopping heparin, but we treat them with a therapeutic intensity non-heparin anticoagulant to reduce their clotting risk. I can't think of any other situation in medicine where we use therapeutic intensity anticoagulation to prevent a clot rather than to treat one. Um, and n- now there's COVID, and there's there's lots of discussion and controversy about whether we should be using higher doses of anticoagulation and even therapeutic intensity anticoagulation for primary prevention of clots in these patients. Yeah, because uh, in these both types of hypercoagulable patients, the HIT or the COVID sick patient, I get my head around it by saying to trainees, you know, the, the play that counts uh, 70, how could they clot? I say, well, that's because you just checked their vein in their arm. Those platelets are all sticking in little clumps in the in the, the toes, as you mentioned. So the COVID toes or COVID fingers are clotting out there. So maybe that's the parallel. The platelets are very busy elsewhere being consumed in a hypercoagulable state. And, you know, of course, we have to address that and treat it. And the, yep. the D-dimer, you mentioned of course, the DIC type phenomenon, the D-dimer is sky high. Is it higher than you've seen in memory and DIC type syndromes? What's up with that? Yeah, the, 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 the critically ill patients in particular have very high D-dimers. And what's clear is that um, the couple interesting things to note about these D-dimers. First, they seem to track with illness severity and, uh, and prognosis. So the higher your D-dimer, the more likely you are to not survive the disease. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, this isn't the the sort of classic picture of overt DIC that we're used to. With overt DIC, the elevated D-dimers are accompanied by low fibrinogen, by thrombocytopenia due to accelerated consumption of clotting factors and platelets. But that's not true in COVID coagulopathy. In COVID coagulopathy, Despite the very high D-dimers, patients tend to have normal or even you, you often elevated fibrinogen levels. And significant thrombocytopenia is uncommon, except in the sort of very sick end-stage patients who may um, evolve to uh, overt DIC. But the, in many patients who are in the ICU quite ill, but not at that point, who have markedly elevated D-dimers, you know, levels that we are not used to seeing in other contexts, and yet their plate will count as fibrinogen or fine. The final clip is from our episode highlighting presentations from ASCO 2020. I discussed the phase three Rapido trial in which researchers compared short course radiotherapy followed by chemotherapy to standard chemoradiotherapy before total mesorectal excision, so-called TME, in patients with locally advanced rectal cancer. Well, Dr. Alan List reviews a phase three trial comparing systemic therapy plus early local therapy to systemic therapy alone in women with de novo stage four breast cancer. On to my next one, I guess number three in my choice, um, which I found really interesting again, abstract number 4006, 4006, entitled, Short Course Radiotherapy Followed by Chemotherapy Before Total Meso Rectal Excision, TME, In locally advanced rectal cancer, the randomized Rapido trial. Now, I had to look up what on earth does Rapido stand for, and it's a catchy reason. Rectal cancer and preoperative induction therapy followed by a dedicated operation, the Rapido trial. So um, there must be uh, some interesting poets in the Netherlands and Sweden where this was done. Dr. Hospers presented and came up with that acronym. So this was for locally advanced rectal cancer, which I've lately seen a lot of in my practice and been always 
attracted by the preoperative approach as opposed to postoperative where patients don't always have the ability to get it because they're recovering from surgery. So um, in this trial, uh, well, before we get to the trial, TNT is a popular neoadjuvant therapy, total neoadjuvant therapy, and you get five cycles of a K-pox or a Fulfox, and then radiation with a, usually a sensitizer like a Cape Cytobine, and then your surgery. So in this study, they said, all right, let's extend that theme, and they claim greater response rates and better outcomes if you give a short course of radiotherapy, this uh, title of three, five, it's called five by five, meaning five days of five gray first only, then subsequent K-pox or full fox four, followed by that total mesorectal excision versus, in this trial, the standard Cape Cytobine-based chemo radiotherapy regimen followed by the TME, followed by postoperative K-pox or full fox standard of care. Large trial, 920 patients randomized, and the complete pathology, res- complete path response rate was 28% in the experimental, the 5x5 the five five initial arm, versus 14% at a medium follow-up of 4.5 years. They showed a three-year disease-related treatment failure, which included local or metastatic, so three-year disease-free, 23 versus 30. So the experimental arm wins there by 7%. And so they, this study, I think, continues to show that getting everything in ahead of surgery, your chemotherapy, your radiation, in this case radiation and chemotherapy, can have better outcomes, and it's probably because you get more in before the patients have surgery, and it's harder to get them through the toxicity uh, post-op. So I thought this continuing the theme of preoperative therapy, a potentially practice-changing study. I couldn't agree more. And, and you know, that PCR rate is, is really very impressive. And, and when Isn't a it, patient though? Yeah. Get the PCR, it means they may be able to preserve their rectum. So it really has um, huge implications for quality of life. Indeed. Um, the next one I wanted to bring up is a topic that happens in our tumor boards about once every couple of months. This was late-breaking abstract number two. And this study addressed whether you should treat an intact primary breast cancer in a patient who has metastatic disease oh, already. Oh, yes. I remember, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, this comes up literally monthly for us. And this is E2108, a randomized phase three trial of systemic therapy plus early local therapy versus systemic therapy alone in women with de novo stage four breast cancer. They looked at about 250 patients who were treated with optimal systemic therapy, whatever the doctor wanted, whatever was appropriate for that patient's tumor after a discussion with the patients in agreement about optimal systemic therapy. They received that for four to eight months. And then if the systemic disease was well-controlled and there was no progression of the primary tumor or regional nodes, they were randomized to either continue systemic therapy or to have systemic therapy and localized treatment, whatever was appropriate for their intact primary um, disease, whatever their institutional standards were. There were about 40% of patients who dropped out for reasons other than progressive disease, but the characteristics of the randomized patients and the patients who dropped out early um, were were basically similar. And what they found was that in a median follow-up of four and a half years, a really pretty long follow-up, there was absolutely no difference in overall survival. The three-year overall survival was 68% with or without local therapy. There was similarly no difference in disease-free survival, but as you might expect, there were more local regional relapses in the group that didn't get local regional treatment, uh, but they then received, about 20% of them received palliative local regional treatment at a later time. The the thing that really interested me about this was that health-related quality of life at 18 months was actually worse in the patients who received the early local therapy, although it was no different at other time points. Um, but, but clearly, health-related quality of life was not increased by getting early local therapy. And, and I think that what this study means is that we probably should not be recommending planned treatments for intact primary tumors in most women who have stage 4 breast cancer. You know, if there's local progression, um, there is no decrement in overall survival, nor in health related quality of life if we give palliative therapy to the primary tumor at the time of the local progression. Um, I I do think that the discussion made a really good point that there are a couple of studies 
now, one particularly that I want to put in a plug for, the, the RT Charm Trial, Alliance 221505, that is ongoing to address the issue of whether there's benefit to treatment of oligometastatic disease or treating local um, disease in patients with oligometastatic disease, and that may be a special subset. And that's it for the Best of Blood and Cancer 2020. Thank you for listening this year. We really appreciate it and hope you enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed doing. Blood and Cancer will be back with new episodes in 2021. Happy New Year.